nation is on our minds, what better time to focus on the Christian's responsibility to government? Uh, if you've been online the last little while, maybe you've seen the, the gamut of ideas relative to, to how a Christian ought to feel towards our government. Uh, everything from, you know, this is God's nation and we're God's people, to, well, the Christian shouldn't even have any connection to the government at all because it's all wicked and we shouldn't have any part in it. And probably everywhere in between those two extremes. But what does the Bible have to say? And the Bible does have a lot to say about how the Christian is connected to the civil government that we live, work, and even worship under in this country and even in others. And that's what we're going to try to talk about today. Uh, we're going to hit on these issues. Now this isn't our outline and those of you who take notes, I don't want you to think that this is going to be uh, the three points we talk about necessarily, but this is, this is sort of what I had in mind to answer as I began to set about this study. Number one, what is God's relationship to the human civil government? Uh, God's relationship is important as it relates to the, the government. And then what is the Christian's obligation to government? And, and what about our conscience? Are there matters of opinion and matters of conscience as it relates to the government that you and I have to work through individually? I think we'll find out that there are. And I think you'll find that some well-respected people in, in the history of our brotherhood have had to struggle with that issue. And I find it interesting to study about that. We're going to start out making this statement. The civil government is necessary at all because of sin. It was not, I contend, God's purpose from the outset of creating man to establish civil government as we know it today. Think about the Garden of Eden. What was the, the societal and governmental structure like? Well, as we see in Genesis chapter 1, God said in verse 26, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, cattle, creeping things, everything that creeps on the earth. In other words, God was to be in charge of man. Man was to be in charge of the physical creation. That was the pecking order governmentally in the Garden of Eden. He didn't say, okay, let's have you know, a king and let's have princes. and let's have." That's not how God designed it in the Garden of Eden. God was to be the head and man was to oversee the creation. That was the way that God designed it. And what a beautiful scene it was. Uh, God walking and them hearing His footsteps in the cool of the day. That intimate, close, personal fellowship with God. That's how it was intended to be. And so we see that in the Garden of Eden, it was not designed to be as it is and as it even has to be now. But then things began to change. After man was driven out of the Garden of Eden, they began to have to organize in a way that maybe was not designed in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 in the Garden of Eden until you get, in fact, to Genesis chapter 10. And notice what you begin to have described by the time Genesis 10 comes along and uh, the population has grown exponentially and has spread out. Look at verse 8. It says, "...and Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth." He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And that's the first time you really have mention of this kingdom idea. And a kingdom, by the way, implies what? A king, right? And so you begin to see sort of a, a large-scale civil government being undertaken where you've got a king who is exercising authority over this sort of large... Uh, uh, mass and region. Now what prompted this change? Obviously it was sin. Because as we're going to see in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 13, uh, the pivotal chapter in the New Testament that describes the relationship and how Christians should relate, or the, the government and how Christians should relate to it, what we see is that the government was designed for a certain set of purposes by God. He says in verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou not then, not then be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, you shall have praise of the same. He's the minister of God to thee for good. But he, but if he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do it that which is evil, he says, be afraid. He bears not the sword in vain. 
And then he goes on to say, for he is the minister of God, a revenger of, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Here's the point. There are really two main purposes for civil government as outlined in Romans 13, 3 and 4. To punish evil and to protect good. Now if there's no sin, do you need those two things? Well, you don't, do you? If there's no sin, if man continued to exist as Adam and Eve did in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 in the Garden of Eden, free from sin, free from evil, there's no need to punish the evil. And there's no need to protect the good. And so the primary needs of civil government don't exist. And so civil government as we know it, as God ordained it, was not necessary before sin came into the world. Government is necessary because of sin. And before I really did a deep dive into the study, I didn't really think about it. We take for granted, you know, where there's no government, there's anarchy. Well, if God is in charge directly, as in the Garden of Eden, that's not anarchy. That's God guiding us in a very direct fashion. And when there's no evil to get in the way, that was the beautiful design that God intended. So we see, number one, then, that civil government is necessary because of sin. Number two, civil government is imperfect even at its best. I am not at all going to, to, uh, to claim that you know, it's wrong to be patriotic. I myself am patriotic. I love this country. I believe this country and the government that it's founded upon is the greatest in the world. And we're not even at our best. But even our great nation at its best is imperfect at best. And we need to understand that and we need to recognize that civil government has been and will always continue to be imperfect. In fact, when God allowed Israel to adopt a physical king, He outlined that very fact. Israel came to God. They came to Samuel actually. And they said, you're old and your sons don't walk in your way. And notice what they said, make us a king to judge us like all the nations. We want a physical earthly king. Of course, the question is, who is the first king of Israel? And people resound, Saul was the first king of Israel. No, God was the first king of Israel. And that's how it was supposed to be. That's how it should have always been, but... Israel decided they wanted a king like all of the other nations, a physical human king. They wanted a civil government in every fashion that that could be said. And so God said, okay, I'm going to give you a physical government. Samuel was obviously offended because Samuel was the, the prophet and the high priest and the judge. If anybody was an authority on earth, it was Samuel. And so when people come to him and say, we want a king, he takes it personally. God said, Samuel, don't take it personally. They have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. Notice this, that I should not reign over them. God was the first king of Israel. But then here's what's really neat, or really interesting for our purposes. He goes on to outline what a physical earthly king will look like. Not physically necessarily, but what their rule will look like. And he outlines some very fundamental problems of physical kingdoms. And I think they're problems we see in the news and we see in the ballot box even today. Here are the demands of a human government. Pick up in verse 11. 1 Samuel chapter 8, and we'll pick up in verse 11. He says, I want you to hearken unto the people. This will be, verse 11, the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He'll take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. Number one, your king is going to need an army. Well, name me a nation that doesn't need an army. That doesn't use an army. And that doesn't use that army to protect its interests. Well, that's what a government uses an army for, right? To protect the interests of the government, of the king, of the leader, of the ruler. And he says that's the very first item on the agenda for any king is they're going to take your sons and your daughters and he's, they're going to force them into service, military service. But then, verse 12, He will appoint him captains over thousands, fifties, and will set them to ear his ground, to reap his harvest, to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. You see, you've got to have manpower to run the governmental machine, don't you? 
to put food on the plates, to, to, to fulfill this office, to answer this phone, to send this email. Whatever it is that needs to be done, you're going to have to conscript service for that too. And so he says the very first set of things that are going to happen is that people are going to be forced into service to the government. And name me a government for better or for worse where that hasn't happened. And the more people that are involved, the more likely there is for there to be corruption and bureaucracy and all of the troubles that we see recorded in every government in the Word of God and that we've seen in every government in the history of mankind. He also says, as you continue, look at verse 14. And He will take your fields and your vineyards, and your oliveyards, even the best of them, and give them to His servants. You know, there's going to, this, to be this thing, and today we call it eminent domain, right? Where the government needs property from you and me. It takes that property, right? And it uses it for its own benefit. There's always going to be situations where the government will think, what you possess, they need more. And there's not a single government on the face of the planet that's not done that. Issues of property rights... Right, personal rights. Where do my rights end and the rights of the government begin? Tell me that's not in the news even as we speak. Turn on Fox News, CNN, and tell me if the idea of civil rights versus government rights doesn't come up every single day in this, our great country. It shows up all over the world. What about taxes? See, taxes is never a problem in this country. Nobody here has an opinion on the tax system in this country. Oh, I'm right. That's good. I'm glad we all agree on that. You see, at the end of the day, every single government wants to take our money. How much of it, how, do they, how they do it, what they use it for, all of those things are up in the air. But the fact of the matter is, they want our money. That's, that's how it goes. Taxation. Well, they need to build roads, they need to protect, they need to punish, they need to do all those things, and all those things cost money. The point I'm making is that all of these things open the door for so many problems. Almost all of the problems that every government faces on a regular basis in every election cycle revolve around these foundational issues. Property, taxes, war the military, defense, all of these things. See, and all of these things become an issue when you institute civil government. It's just a part of it. Every civil government is going to face these issues. And God warned His people from the outset. If you establish a physical king, this is what's going to happen. So number one, civil government is necessary because of sin. Number two, Every civil government, no matter how great, is imperfect at best. Number three, civil government's not the church. Now that should go without saying, shouldn't it? The United States is not God's people. I don't know if it could ever actually be said truly that this nation is a godly nation. Not in the truest sense, can it? You see, we have this conception, we have this idea, and it's deep-seated, and it's, and it's rooted in our traditions and in our culture, that, that somehow God is inextricably connected to our country and our country alone. And it's almost part of, of how we view ourselves. But the fact of the matter is that Christ is connected to His church. And that is His kingdom. That is His nation. We are citizens of a heavenly place before we're citizens of any country, as Christians, as members of the body of Christ. And we've got to separate those things. See, sometimes we begin to think that our political rights and our political ideas are the same as our spiritual rights and our spiritual ideas, and we begin to get all those things confused. But that's not the case. This evening, we need to praise God, and we'll talk more about this later, for the right to worship here freely. We need to praise God for the, the, the nice roads and the clean air and the safe food and water and all of the wonderful things that we enjoy more than any other nation in the world from top to bottom. 
But none of those rights really have anything to do with our obligation to God. That's the fact of the matter. If every one of those rights right this second were taken away, our obligation to God would not change. Because civil government is not the church. And whether we're in communist China or whether we're in the United States of America, the church is the same. And we need to separate our understanding of those things as we move forward. What rights, what political rights are protected by God's Word? It's interesting, Jesus in particular, but God throughout the Bible addresses our rights. What we see is our core political rights, and we should. What about our right against personal injury? You know, it's been said that my rights begin where Marion's, or my rights end where Marion's face begins. You know, that, that's true. You know, I have a right up until the point where I make contact with his face in anger and then my rights end, right? What does Jesus say about that? If someone smites you on one cheek, what should you do? Turn the other also. Okay, well, what about property rights, right? What, what about my right for property? If somebody takes your coat, give them cloak also. What about right to my time? What about right to my business endeavors? Jesus says, look, if someone compels you to go a mile, go twain. Do you know about that compulsion to go a mile according to the Roman customs of the day? If you passed a military outpost and they needed you to take supplies or, or post or something from one place to another, it didn't matter if you had the most pressing need ever. If they wanted you to take something from point A to point B, you had to do it up until a certain point. They could force you into their service. And Jesus said, if they take your rights away, He says, He didn't say anything about picketing and protesting. He said, they make you go a mile, go two. You see, we're so overcome and, and so concerned with our rights, and we should be. But if we strip it all away to the church and our obligation to God, all of those things melt away. See, and that's something that it's so hard for us to comprehend because we take for granted the political rights that we have that many, many cultures, maybe even the majority of cultures throughout the history of mankind have not enjoyed. And at the end of the day, those have very little to do with our obligation to God. What about free speech? Certainly a big deal. For the Christian, I certainly appreciate the fact that I can stand in this pulpit and I can talk about God's will concerning homosexuality and same-sex marriage and abortion as we did a few weeks ago without the fear of, of losing my property, my freedom, my life. But you see, in reality, I don't have free speech anyway. Jesus said, every idle word that man shall speak, he shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. I'm not free to say whatever I want anyway. God has already directed and dictated that. You see, a Christian worldview changes my perspective on rights and privileges and who really determines the rights and privileges that I have. You see, it's not really and ultimately the Constitution that does it. It's God. And that's something I think so often that we lose sight of. You see, my rights and privileges ought to really start as a Christian when I consider the Word of God. Peter understood that. It's true on the, on the spectrum that I said, hey, we allow certain things to happen because we are Christians, but there's a limit, isn't there? In Acts 4 and verse 19, Peter asked this rhetorical question, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God, judge ye. Well, we know the answer to that, right? Well, of course it's not right to hearken unto man more than God. And he says as much in the very next chapter, we ought to obey God rather than men. But that's not a sweeping statement, is it? That's in the context of preaching God's Word at the risk of imprisonment or keeping your mouth shut so you can be free. And Jesus says, given, or Peter said, given that choice, I'm going to preach the gospel because I ought to obey God rather than men. You see, the church and civil government are not the same thing. And we can love and respect our civil government while at the same time understanding that at the end of the day, we're Christians first. 
and everything else is secondary. Number four. With that in mind, Christians must submit to civil government so long as it does not prohibit our ability to submit to God. I have that obligation. Even if my property rights are violated. Even if my personal rights are violated. The only record we have of people going against the laws of the land in the Bible is when they are forbidden to preach or practice New Testament Christianity. Do we really understand that? Peter didn't say, you've taken away my property, so I ought to obey God rather than men. He says, you won't let me preach. I hope we understand that we must submit to civil government so long as it does not prohibit our ability to submit to God. Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So that wasn't written in a vacuum. It wasn't written concerning the government of the United States of America or the Constitution of the United States. You know what that statement, when that statement was written and under what government that statement was written? The Roman government. And do you know who wrote that? The same Paul who experienced everything that's outlined in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Most of which was at the hands of some level of civil government. Have you ever thought about that? The Paul who would die in prison, who would die a, crim a prisoner, that same Paul said, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, and the powers that be are ordained of God. The word ordained means assigned or appointed to a certain position. See, government was put in place by God. God said, okay, I'm in charge, Christians are here, and I'm going to put civil government here. That doesn't mean, although he's in charge of every world power, they rise and fall at his will. I understand that. But it's not as if God said, let me design the Roman government to be wicked. Well, the Roman government was wicked. But in so much as they carried out any good thing, they did so to accomplish God's will. Every time the United States of America does some good thing, they're carrying out the will of God. Every time they punish an evildoer, every time they protect the good rights of people, they are carrying out the will of God. Because God set in place where government was in the pecking order. And my obligation is to be subject to those higher powers. I mentioned rights earlier. There's really only one right that is specifically mentioned in the New Testament. And I find this very interesting. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul tells Timothy, he says, I exhort therefore, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks, be made for all men. And then he zeroes in specifically. For kings and for all that are in authority. What's he saying? Pray for the civil government. That they won't touch my stuff. That the taxes will be low. That they'll reform health care. Did Paul tell Timothy to pray for any of that? Now, we, need to, we can pray for those things. I'm not saying don't. But what's the most important matter that Paul outlines that the government needs to protect for the Christian? That we may live, what? A quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. The word quiet comes from a word that means lonesome. The word peaceable comes from a word that means to be able to sit down. In other words, I want, I want them to leave us alone and let us sit where we want to sit. God's, Paul says to Timothy, the most important right that our government needs to protect is our right to do what we're doing right now. That's the most important right. Everything else is secondary. The right to preach and to teach and to follow the will of God. And if a government protects that, then they're doing what we're told to pray for in 1 Timothy chapter 2. I hope that we treat that as primary in everything that we do. And you know what's really interesting? Even in the early days of our country, that was really the touchstone issue. You hear a lot about separation of church and state. We understand that that, that idea is not found specifically, the, the wording, in our Constitution or in any of its amendments. But it is grounded if we properly look at it in some of the things that we see. 
This statement in front of you tonight is from the Danbury Baptist Association in 1801. And they drew up a letter defining what they see as the government's job. Here's what they say, Our sentiments are uniformly on the side of religious liberty. That religion is at all times and places a matter between God and individuals. That no man ought to suffer in name, person, or effects on account of his religious opinions. That the legitimate power of civil government extends no further than to punish the man who works ill to his neighbor. What have we been talking about? Romans 13, protect the good and punish the evil. 1 Timothy 2, allow us to live a godly life in all, in, in, with peace and honesty. You see, those are the foundational principles of what God needs a government to do for His people. And that's the very thing under consideration here. You say, well, why is this important? Well, it's important because Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter in response to the Danbury Association's letter to him in which he mentioned separation of church and state. What he was saying is, I agree wholeheartedly with what this association has said that our ability to worship God freely is one of the most important rights that we can enjoy in any nation and in any country. That's the true context of separation of church and state. One individual said it this way, While many who misinterpret the First Amendment clamor for freedom of religion, they have actually traveled down a path towards freedom from religion which eventually results in hostility toward religion. Does that sound like the world we live in today? You see, uh, the Establishment Clause isn't really about eradicating religion from having any impact in the world around us, but rather ensuring that the government does not pick one religion over another and allows and protects our freedom to do what we're doing today. That's the basis of what we're talking about. Not freedom from religion, but freedom of religion. And there's a drastic difference. A drastic difference. And we need to continually pray that we will always have freedom of religion to be able to do what we're doing here today. So that's the primary thing. Christians must submit in hopes that our rights to do what we do will always be protected. Number five, Christians must maintain their values in interaction with the government. Now what do I mean by that? What I mean is we're Christians first, and any interaction with the government must bear that in mind. I am a Christian. When I vote, when I pay taxes, when I, whatever, when I run for office, when I'm in office, whatever it is that I do in connection with the government, I do as a Christian. And I need to understand that in every aspect of what I do. I mentioned this as it related to uh, the abortion issue the other day. In John chapter 12, you've got chief rulers. You've got people with a whole lot to lose who believed in Jesus. But because of their political affiliation. They did not confess Him lest they should be kicked out of the synagogue. Why? They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. You see, we need to recognize this evening that no matter what our political affiliation, our foremost political affiliation is Christian. And that needs to be who I am and what I am concerning everything that I do as it relates to my interaction with civil government. I am a Christian. Now, the last thing to talk about this evening is, is something that I found very interesting as I was doing research. And when I was asked to speak on this topic, I, I really did think of this. Uh, you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you have Gospel Advocate Commentary Series in your libraries at home? There's, there's one here. If you have a biblical library at home, the chances are really good that you have the Gospel Advocate Commentary Series. Now, some of them are better than others. Guy and Woods, for instance, on John and 1 John, really amazing. This is David Lipscomb's commentary on the book of Romans. And of particular interest is his comments in Romans chapter 13. 
You see, David Lipscomb, and you all know him very well. You probably know that name. You're familiar with him. He was a prolific writer. He was a good, a wonderful gospel preacher, a good Christian man. Uh, David Lipscomb was also a pacifist. He, he became convinced that the Christian could not take up arms under any circumstances. And he took that to the extreme. He believed that because a Christian could not be involved in that sort of thing, that they could not vote for elected officials who would one day probably vote for war and would send people to war, could not partake in a government that would one day advocate war. And so the dominoes that fell indicated in his mind that a Christian should submit to government but have no direct involvement with the government. Shouldn't run for office, shouldn't vote, shouldn't serve in the military, and so on and so forth. Now, he does his best to argue his points, and if you would like to, to see those, look up Romans 13, or I have a copy of, uh, of his uh, book on the subject uh, in digital version that you can look at at your own convenience. Now, why do I bring that up? I bring that up because in varying degrees, people have issues of conscience relative to the civil government. And I think it's good to address those whenever we talk about it. We know what matters of conscience are, don't we? We don't have time to get into Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 8, which simply says, if there's a matter that is not strictly defined in the Bible, you've got to make up your own mind on it. The example is what? Meat offered to idols. You go to Kroger's, you buy meat. Has that meat been offered to an idol? I don't know. Well, if you don't know, don't ask any questions. Go home and eat it. If you do know, and you know that an idol is nothing, go home and eat it. If you do know, and it hurts your conscience, you say, well, that meat's been offered to an idol. That meat's defiled. Well, then you don't need to eat that meat. But you also better not condemn your brother or sister who does. And y'all probably shouldn't even talk about it because it's just going to end in an argument. And maybe you can work your way out of that. And that's the gist of 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans 14. You see, and that applies to so many aspects of our lives. And doesn't it apply sometimes? to our relationship to civil government? Absolutely it might. What about these, these questions? Can a Christian serve in the military or serve in the government? Can a Christian be a member of a political party? Can a Christian run for office? Can a Christian be a part of law enforcement or the military? David Lipscomb would argue, no. But I find it very interesting. In Acts chapter 10 and 11, there's a man known as the... Centurion, right? There's a centurion. And that particular centurion was converted to Christ. He was an example, in fact, of a Gentile obeying the gospel. Now here's what's interesting about that. What is a centurion? He's a Roman soldier. At your own convenience, read through Acts 10 and 11 and find where Peter told the centurion that he had to lay down his arms after he became a Christian. I don't think you'll find it. And you can go through example after example. You can go to Luke chapter 3 when John was teaching and baptizing folks. You know who came to him among others? Soldiers. Now, uh, commentators are split as to whether they were Jewish soldiers or Roman soldiers. It doesn't matter. If they're Jews, they're working for Herod who was essentially aligned with the Romans. And so these Jews came, these soldiers came out and they asked John, what should we do? You know what he didn't say? He didn't say, quit the army. He said, do extortion, do violence and extortion to no man. The word violence there means to extort by violence. Do that to no man. In other words, behave yourself as a soldier. And he sent them on their way. You see, the point is, nowhere in the New Testament do we see people who are soldiers told not to be soldiers. And if it was as some might claim, well, those things would be mutually exclusive, but they're not. So the fact of the matter is, if there's a person who believes that they can't in good conscience serve in one of those positions, well, they don't need to do that. But they also don't need to condemn people who do. It falls squarely in the realm of conscience. Can a Christian take money from the government? Well, duh. I know people who have problems giving to the government but have no problem taking from the government. I find that to be inconsistent, but maybe they can work that out on their own. I don't know. But the bottom line is, if you feel like 
The government's not going to handle your money properly and you need to do something else, well, that's up to you. Preachers, for instance, have the ability to opt out of Social Security based on a conscience issue. Well, if that's truly how they are convicted, more power to them. I'm not convicted in that way. Now, what about this? Can a Christian vote for a candidate who does not live according to moral principles? You want to talk about a political idea that we have to work out for ourselves. How much immorality can you stand in a political candidate? There have been times when I had to write Danielle in. She's not one yet. Maybe one day she will. Of course, you've got to declare, and you got to, I know you've got to do all that stuff, but it's fun. Because sometimes I look at it, no, no, not going to do it. But others might argue, well, you're wasting your vote if you don't do this. You don't. Okay, we can, we can talk about that. And every person needs to be convicted along those lines. But you see, there are some areas where we really have to work this out ourselves. And at the end of the day, what Paul said in Romans 14 and verse 5 comes into play. One man esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. And then here's the point. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You better do your homework, you better do your research. And you better make sure that what you believe is well informed from God's Word. And if there happens to be a gray area and you have to make a decision based on your conscience, do it with understanding and prayer and patience. And that applies to so many aspects of our lives, but certainly as it relates to civil government. And so we've talked about a lot tonight. Civil government's only necessary because of sin. At its best, every government is imperfect. Civil government is not the church. We cannot confuse those two things. We need to understand that as Christians have the opportunity and to the best of our ability, we must submit to the civil government as long as it does not violate our obligations to God. We must understand that even when we do that, we must maintain our faith and our behavior as Christians in the body of Christ. And then we have to work out matters of conscience in those gray areas to the best of our ability. What a wonderful nation we live in, in so many ways. And it's certainly far from perfect. What I want us to remember tonight is that you and I are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. If anyone can ever change our government, it's going to have to be Christians. It's going to have to be you and me. And if we throw our hands in the air and we say, I give up, well, we're giving it back to the one who owns it. Satan, the God of this world. But if we fight the good fight, maybe we can turn the tide. But at the end of the day, how do you change the world? I don't know a lot. Uh, Alan Jackson sang a song shortly after the uh, destruction of the World Trade Center and all of those events in uh, 2001. Where were you when the world stopped turning? And the chorus begins like this. I'm just a singer of simple songs. I'm not a real political man. I watch CNN, but I'm not sure I can tell you the difference in Iraq and Iran. That's sort of where I am. I'm not a super political person. But I can tell you this. If you want to change the world, I don't believe it starts with our government or any government. I think it starts with you and with me individually. Because you see, if I change me, if we change each other, that changes our families. And if our families change, our communities change. If our communities change, our states change. If our states change, our country changes. You see, here's the sad truth. Our government is really just a reflection of us. And if we don't like what we see, maybe we need to look in the mirror. And we need to change who we are collectively. And really, if we do that, then change will come. So this evening, are you a Christian? No matter what nation we might have been in tonight, and we're among the privileged few to have been born in such a wonderful and protective place as the United States of America, but no matter where we might have ended up tonight, that question still rings, are you a Christian?
What must I do to be saved? Believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be baptized, buried with Christ, and raised to walk a new life, Romans 6, 3, and 4. But maybe tonight you're a Christian, and maybe you have strayed from the truth. Maybe you've become disillusioned by the world that you see. Dear friend, don't give up hope. Work, and know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Tonight, do you need to be restored? Is there sin in your life? Obey the gospel, be restored, as together we stand and sing.